Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for joining. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us. Uh, we can see right now that there are about 166 people in the auditorium. And I'm already scrolling through the screen left and right. And it would be great if you, if you want to turn on your cameras at least for a couple of minutes to have a, to have a brief uh, contact and <laughs> say good morning, hello, 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 familiar faces. I see on my first screen Anna Maria and Michi and Antoine Vial and, and uh, many other friends. Uh, great to have you with us. So uh, today uh, uh, we are in our uh, session number three of the lecture series. Architecture of Territory, Territorial Design in Histories, Theories, and Projects. And we have uh, our uh, first uh, guest uh, of the season, uh, Alexandra Aren, a landscape architect, um, uh, cartographer, designer, theorist, uh, who is completing her PhD at the University of Manchester. She will tell us uh, more about it in her lecture on the critical zones in a couple of minutes. But first, uh, before we even introduce Alexandra in her honor and to have a, a let's say a warm up uh, all together, <laughs> preparing uh, for uh, this talk, uh, let us uh, begin with two concepts of the morning. Metaxia will share the screen and you will... Um... Oops, sorry. So hello everyone uh, from my side. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there is something here. Um, so hello everybody and welcome to our Zoom auditorium. Uh, so as every time we start also together with our um, session exercise, so all of you um, having a last name starting from A to M, uh, you can take a blue pen or a blue uh, marker and the term Anthropocene. So on a white A4 paper, you try to sketch or interpret this word um, as you understand it. And the rest of you, so uh, your last name starting from N to Z, you hold a red marker, a red pen, and you take the word Gaia. Or so sometimes Gaia. Gaia. Gaia, sorry, that's the Greek. Hi. <laughs> you are you're Greek. The real one. You're Greek, right? <laughs> sorry, excuse my Greek uh, word. So um, great. we give you uh, five minutes. So as said, what you have to do is to sketch those terms and uh, photograph them and upload them to our WhatsApp group. So in five minutes from now, we will share the screen to the WhatsApp group and we can comment your terms. Starting from now. Of course, this can also be a, a written um, uh, observations, uh, associative concepts, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, let's say, personal uh, definitions. I'm sure you're all uh, talking about Anthropocene, but uh, Gaia is perhaps uh, something that comes not so often in a conversation. Okay, my WhatsApp starts pinging now. <laughs> oh, we have... Um one and a half minute left, but whoever is ready, you can start uploading so we can start commenting on your exercises. Would you like to already? Yes. Or maybe wait until the time is up. <laughs> I think it's bad. So I would give still half a minute and then we can start sharing the, the WhatsApp to have enough time to comment. Okay.
Great. I already see some very interesting endeavors. <laughs> yes, me too. It's fascinating. <laughs> Okay, go. I think we can start sharing, right? Uh, yeah, let's share it. Okay, so pencils down, as we would say, and we start. Uh, sorry, let me adjust to my screen. Um, so red, red ones are Gaia and blue ones are Anthropocene. It's fascinating how similar <laughs> the, the drawings sometimes are. Perfect. So I'm just scrolling through and uh, all the panel, you take the freedom to comment. Okay, time is over officially. <laughs> uh, take the freedom to comment, stop me and ask students questions. Yeah. Latour. I think it looks like a tree. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. oh, this is uh, unexpected. It looks like a Robert Smithson concrete rundown or something like that. I'm not sure I really. <laughs> understand it but <laughs> oh that's nice <laughs> okay the the apple is eaten this is a uh, uh, maybe Gaia the whole okay this is interesting there is a there is a it's another uh, a kind of organic metaphor nice Here we see a, um, a kind of a, a cycles, uh, evolutionary cycles. It's a lot about human scale, human footprint. Ah, here is the footprint <laughs> construction. <laughs> Great. Indeed. So I, I think we are we are familiar. Now this is interesting, the, the blue lines. Maybe maybe the blue lines were were a, a kind of a uh oh cool. <laughs> okay. okay, here we have a, a footprint. Okay, great. Thank you, David. A lot about feet. <laughs> Yeah, oh, this is this is nice. This is Rodin, no? Mm -hmm. The the he has to think a little bit, right? Mm -mm. <laughs> Why sitting on the planet? He should now think. Yes, the Atlas has to think again. That's good. This is nice. The wonderful Anthropos. <laughs> Anthropos. Wow, that's Greek. great. <laughs> Wonderful. Very nice. We, we had a lot more, uh, uh -huh, we are now, uh, Ga Gaia is coming later. Maybe it was, uh, okay, we have the feminine now. This is interesting. Ah, wow, I love this. Wow, this is just uh, wonderful. Thomas, thank you. Nice to see this smiley face. Mm -hmm. Gosh, bro. Uh, okay, it's uh, it's going very very fast, and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, Thank so here here we see here we really see a goddess. That's nice. Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. This is also interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. You know, sometimes when we when we did uh, this uh, in our auditorium, uh, and uh, sometimes the interpretations are so similar. And uh, you know, I would think, well, you know, the, the kind of ideas travel through the auditorium. But this is so interesting because you are you are all sitting in your apartments and and we still have this kind of a let's say common that's really that's a beautiful uh lucia wonderful so uh, uh <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's fantastic how similar that was also there there are uh, so many wonderful ones i i'm really really uh really grateful to, to see this and i'm wondering uh, if it's time to stop sharing Maybe we can uh, we can indeed now stop. I think uh, it was a, it was a wonderful um, kind of a still frame uh, movie, uh, which uh, which we created together in a few minutes. Thank you so much, and uh, um, uh, let us uh, let us now uh, 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 move toward the lecture. So Nasli Nasli will introduce Alexandra this morning. Yes. So hello everyone. Lily is speaking from Istanbul, by the way. Yes, <laughs> greetings <laughs> from Istanbul and hello everyone. I hope you can all yes. hear me. Today we are really delighted to welcome Alexandra Ren, the first among the five guest speakers we have within our sub-series My Earth, which I guess you all know by now is the special thematic of this semester lecture series. So our aim in choosing this uh, My Earth as a theme was to mood the multiple meanings it possesses and find out the manifold ways that it could be represented in. And looking at her work, having Alexandra as the first guest speaker seems like a very apt choice for us. Alexandra is a French landscape architect and a PhD researcher at the University of Manchester. The working title of her PhD is Architectural Design at the Time of Anthropocene, a Geographic Approach to the Critical Zones, so two of the concepts you had today, just now. And her supervisor are Professor Albana Yaneva and uh, Professor Stephen Walker. She also co-founded Societed Objects Cartography in uh, 2016, which is a think tank on earth political design, drawing on scientific and public inquiries, and producing workshops and exhibitions. Uh, the re studio recently designed the inst installation space at the ZKM, Centrum für Kunst und Medien, Karlsruhe, for the exhibition Critical Zones, Observatories for Earthly Politics, uh, curated by Bruno Latour, which was also one of the uh, texts you had uh, for reading. Uh, the exhibition was the result of a close collaboration between science and art. And now uh, you can find the link to this exhibition in the chat room. We are very much looking forward to hearing Alexandra talk about her experiences and findings in the critical zone observatories and see her experimental cartographies or uh, as she refers to them as geographies of the Anthropocene in more detail. This we believe will give us the critical hints in understanding and representing our complex and uncertain ecologies as architects and planners. Uh, so welcome Alexandra and uh, here we leave the word to you. Uh, Thank maybe. you. Oh, sorry. No, just uh, from our side, uh, we would like to ask you to switch off your cameras during the lecture of Alexandra. Thank you, Alexandra, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Natalie, and thanks uh, to the team to having me today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be um, in this class. Uh, I would, well, and thank you for your exercise because uh, it's very revealing and it was very interesting to see how uh, you uh, put the Anthropocene and Gaia and how you put humans uh, in the side of the Anthropocene and no humans in uh, the side of Gaia. So we will try to, um, uh, to disentangle these terms. So I will share my screen. Uh, and I will uh, start so the lecture. And when I uh, was preparing this presentation, I didn't realize uh, at first uh, the striking resemblance between the representation of the earth or the geography that I'm going to present to you and the lockdown situation. 
And so indeed, uh, you will see that this representation of the earth, uh, which we are developing with scientists, philosophers, architects, uh, artists, historians, or sociologists, so it's really a work in progress, uh, and it suggests that the earth uh, is closed and that we are in fact confined to the film of the critical zone. And the critical zone is really where all living beings, uh, including us, uh, are living uh, with the entire biosphere. And we have always resided. And I hope to show you that uh, we are never outside, even when we are in a landscape, because we are always inside this critical zone, this part of the earth entirely built by living organisms. So I use this uh, lockdown uh, metaphor, but to make you feel maybe more intensely in, uh, what it is to be inside the earth. But I also hope to convince you that it has a completely different meaning and that we should be uh, happy to be enclosed uh, inside the earth. But my main concern is that we don't have representations uh, of this condition and that we, the aerial maps uh, that we use uh, in landscape design project, for example, uh, don't really give us the impression, impression that we are only and always inside the earth, inside the critical zone. From the aerial point of view, everything seems stable, under control. This is a kind of reassuring or silent, pacified view of the space. And so the territory seems uh, perfectly controlled uh, with the aerial maps. However, uh, this is a representation haunted by its ghosts. Indeed, maps carry a thousand ghosts in their hidden faces. They kind of simplify the space, but how could, could it be otherwise? Because a cartographer has always has to ask how to prioritize a voice over another one, how to synthesize without taking part, and how to negotiate the scale and how to render visible tiny entities. Maps, uh, we argue, are however important because they allow shareable knowledge on territory and there are also tools accounting for disputed lands, such as uh, these uh, middle age figures uh, in France, which uh, cartograph uh, the disputes on uh, the same territory, the different views. And so in this lecture, we will try to understand what is the terrestrial and how to map it how to map a territory full of contradictions because of the Anthropocene, which disorients ourselves in time and space. So the lecture is kind of structured in six parts. Uh, first, we will introduce what is the Anthropocene. Uh, then we will follow the scientists uh, in the critical zone uh, where they try to detect ghost landscapes and we will try to, uh, to um, understand what is this ghost landscape. Then I will propose you a thought experiment, uh, an exploration, exploration narrative uh, with a soil map. Then I will say the word uh, on what is geography and how we can maybe model it with our tools. Then I will talk shortly, uh, quickly about the exhibition at the uh, ZKM Museum in Germany. And uh, at the end, uh, we will propose you a little exercise uh, with the model soil. Uh, and I will just introduce the book uh, which uh, the model is ex extracted. So first, the Anthropocene. What is it? So we often imagine that the soil is firm and stable. But from a geological point of view, it appears quite differently. Exposed to multiple anthropic pressures, it moves, crumbles, slides, sinks, and collapses. Spanning from the earth crust to the finest layers of our fertile soils, the action of tectonic plates and the water cycle activated by the sun's energy, combined with the activities of living organisms, the soil is never left to rest. From local pressures to unalterable death, Geological history, however, covers periods of time from which humans seem excluded until recently. Indeed, the geological history of the 21st century is quite different. With the evidence gathered by scientists, we can never deny nor remain indifferent to the fact that humans have become a major geological force 
but it is not only rapidly transforming the chemical and physical composition of the earth, but also disrupting, disrupting ecosystems at such a rate that they do not have time to adapt. Humans exploit the death, disturb the strata, create layers of plastic and concrete, shape the earth to the point that a history of the conquest of the earth's death could be told. In the Anthropocene, we are facing two disorientations. One, the world we live in is reacting under our feet. And two, the world we live from is actually disappearing from real. Indeed, humans not only move soils within the same area, but they also move soils from one place to another. So the sand floor from sea floors, the sand from the sea floors is used to build concrete buildings, uh, as you certainly know. And so a wall here is in fact a hole dug elsewhere. This is what an historian, Pomraz, called ghost acreages. With this notion, he argues that developed countries exploit resources from other countries and thus increasing their land surfaces without depleting the ones inside their legal borders. So the ghost acreages are the acreages that we don't see to use, that we don't do live on or in, and that, that we need for, it, for our living while causing environmental and social damages somewhere far away. For example, uh, you certainly know that Europe used thousands of colonized lands for plantations uh, for its food. So that Anat Singh calls the Anthropocene actually the Plantationocene, focusing the attention on land exploitation, soil and landscape, and arguing that plantations is the early form of capitalism and ghost and slave colonized lands. The ghost acreages can be felt at different scales like uh, Russian dolls. While urban citizens live from ghost form acreages, rural territories import fertilizers from afar. Ghosts as well as ruins are everywhere. Where we live in and where we live from don't seem to match. So why, why uh, are we not seeing the ghost acreages? Maybe because according to uh, Bruno Latour, we don't have a good representation of the earth. We always consider it as a blue marble suspended in the infinite, full of resources with well-defined stable borders. And yet we don't live there. This view is a complex art artifact. Indeed, instead, we live in the critical zone, the thin layer at the surface of the earth, much more complex than previously thought, because modified and maintained by habitable, uh, living, by, maintained habitable sorry, by living beings. From the critical view, the planet does have boundaries, as shown since 2009 by the Earth Ion system. So how do we improve our ability to bridge this gap between the territory we live in and the one we live from, from where we steer our resources? Latour argues that we have to go through a description of our soil. And this is actually the work of a group of scientists recording carefully the composition of a portion of the land. Critical zone scientists set observatories in landscapes equipped with many sensors to become sensitive and getting new understanding on major environmental issues such as droughts, soil depletion or pollution. The critical zone observatory is a watershed equipped with scientific instruments that give new insight into the complexity of the soil from the bedrock to the canopy of the trees that draw their nutrients from these rocks. As this process is poorly known in terms of reactions, variation and evolutions, the observatories are located at different places on Earth. And so this new outdoor laboratory facilities contributes to the construction of a new way at looking at the earth, a new globe, but much uh, scattered. And so the critical view does not correspond with this blue marble of the infinite uh, space, as we will see. And the critical zone seems to me much muddy, chaotic with multiple acting agents. In a world, it's much more populated than the view from above, as we are going to see in the next uh, chapter. 
So the ghost landscape of the critical zone detected by scientists can be, for example, the soil that disappears through the process of erosion. That is, the soil that leaves one point to be transported to other points downstream of rivers by depositing sediments. It's a natural cycle, but now soil erodes faster than to, due to human construction and soil impermeabilization. Scientists are able to trace the loss of soil thanks to chemical tracers. They follow its movement, its trajectory through the watershed. They are able to know how fast the soil is flipping away. And the speed can be really frightening. In Taiwan, for example, the soil loses 10 centimeters per year, but is eight, uh, 80 centimeters on the scale, scale of a life, lifetime. So the soil is a kind of ghost, and another one is water. And as you know, uh, water is an important issue uh, in climate change. In the Vosges Forest Observatory, uh, so the Vosges is a forest at the border of France and Germany, I followed the scientists in their daily practices uh, and during the recordings uh, in July, uh, we reached uh, 38 degrees uh, and it hadn't rained for more than a month. The snow, which normally recharges the ground uh, with water, had hardly fallen during the winter and so if there is no, no, there is no water charge. And when we were in the field in July, uh, the water had become really ghostly, like a missing element, no drops in the normally filled bags that the scientists are collecting. It was as if the scientists were constantly talking about water, but we couldn't see it. In fact, to be able to see it, they use a really sophisticated machine, the gravimeter that you see here, which records the mass of the water table at great depth. But because the groundwater signal is so tiny, this is uh, the last one uh, in the diagram, uh, compared to over signal of the scale of the Earth, so they have to erase the information of the mass of the Earth. They must also remove an important gravity, the tidal wave, whose effects can be felt under the Vosges mountains. And to pick up the tiny signal from the water table, which varies only a few centimeters over the year, and which is about 10 to 20 centimeters thick underground, uh, I was really surprised to learn how thin it is. They, uh, they have to erase the noise of the North Sea waves breaking on the shore. So it's uh, also a kind of ghost signal or a ghostly echo of the earth that can be felt everywhere. In the same observatory, we can feel uh, negatively the ghost acreages that we cause in other parts of the world because the scientists trace the sulfur, which causes acid rain and the death of the tree in this forest. Thanks to the gutters, this kind of devices that we see on the uh, left of the screen, the screen, the scientists collect the rain and analyze it in the lab. And they see the amount of sulfur contained in the rain and they discovered that a huge amount, amount of sulfur comes from Asia, sometimes in less than 20 days in good weather conditions. So our clothes that may actually be produced in Asia in factories, burn gas and produce sulfur. But this sulfur is coming to us faster than the clothes we are potentially going to consume. But it comes back in another form, that of acid rain. So we don't necessarily understand the connection at first, at first glance, uh, this connectedness uh, of the earth. And so what is global is um, not an idea, it is what we experience at a local point, a phenomenon that may have been generated at another very distant local point. Uh, with these uh, three short stories of the field, um, I hope I could have telling uh, three different kinds of ghost landscapes. There is three types of ghosts uh, when I was thinking about the critical zone. The ghost has depletion or disappearance due to overuse with the soil. The ghost has hidden part of the critical zone for the, with the water. And finally, the ghost has haunted effect, something forgotten which is coming back with hunger, let's say.
with the sulfur. And the more I think about the interest of critical zones for our territorial studies, the more they appear to me, they appear to me as a network of sensors to understand ghost landscapes. They reveal the ghost hidden by our naturalistic view of nature. The instruments are indeed intensification procedures like the gravimeter. The critical zone observatory is an equipped space that allows us to understand how each entity is linked to another, where it acts, where the water goes underground, where the atmosphere goes, where the soil erodes. They bring these ghosts back to life. Because indeed the Anthropocene produces ghosts. But the new devices sensor of, of the critical zone can detect these ghosts. So we can no longer avoid them, not, hear, uh, not hearing their voices. And maybe at the end, of the trip, of the journey, we may no longer see ghosts, we may see living landscapes. Reflecting on this sensor, how could we architect describe a ghost, a ghost landscape? How do we do it? First of all, uh, we may need sensors, an instrument, a tool, to be able to describe in a more vivid or more complex way what a landscape is, which is no more a taken for granted object like, like we saw with the water, soil, and sulfur examples, which are, which are uh, sorry, highly reactive to each other and to other elements. And so pixel by pixel, the scientists recompose what a landscape is, not in a geographical view, but rather in an intensive and perhaps more molecular view. Now we are doing a little speculative uh, exercise uh, literally to, uh, kind of uh, fiction speculative. And I uh, need you uh, to put your yourself uh, in the shoes of someone who have to draw the map of this landscape. How do you make this alternative visualization? What are the steps that you will need to follow? So first of all, you will need to find the right instruments to obtain the data. You would then have to connect to other specialists or perhaps build the instruments yourself according to your knowledge. Then you will have to take the instruments to the field. You cannot map it from above, just using satellite views, because you don't be able to decipher more complex things that are happening in the river or in the soil, like the scientists. Cartography has indeed established a distorted relationship with reality. Landscape entities have been made stable by the forms inscribed on the map which thus become reality, the only materiality, because maybe we have no longer questioned and described the practice of cartography and the process necessary for its elaboration. That is the different tools, gestures, the relationship to the site and to the multiple encounters that we may encounter during the field. So the rediscovering the practice of cartography may mean getting back on the ground moving from place to place with a tool that is half new, half revamped. So when you bring this instrument, your model, your map to the field, you have to collect your data in a certain way and you have to make it transportable. That is, you have to bring this knowledge back to your workshop, like the scientist laboratory. And so you also have to find the right way of writing down inscriptions that accurately reproduce what you have collected. And by doing this uh, step by step, you start to create your own captions. But in order to be able to share these captions, you will have to make them knowable, shareable. So you will have to explain them, to describe them, to write them down. This is a very important notion. Narration, narrations are uh, never separated from visualization. It goes hand to hand. In other words, there, can, there cannot be a map without a narrative, a textual description. I will now suggest you a thought experiment to demonstrate, uh, I hope, the power of narrative. What if the Earth was an unknown planet? And let's try to equip ourselves for, for this uh, exploration. We are not going to discover new lands, but we could learn to see the territories around us differently. We will need new visualization tools, 
optical instruments to capture ghost landscapes through its death, movements and ruins. Now I will just uh, end with my uh, screen sharing and I will copy paste a link in the chat uh, Zoom and please open it. So it's a, it's a Vimeo link uh, and please add my signal uh, play uh, start on the video. So I will just wait a few moments for everyone to get uh, the link because I'm going to talk over this video because my connection, uh, my internet connection is not so good. So I prefer that you uh, follow the Vimeo uh, the video on, on your own browser. So if everyone is getting the link, maybe just um, waves or no, I can't see, I can't see anyone. So, okay, so I will start. So please uh, play, play now. Sorry. So this is the earth. Oops. So this is the earth, but not the smooth, shiny blue marble. Grasping the globe sideways means no longer being on an isotropic space, but grasping the traces, pores, marks, tattoos, scores, scratches of its skin. To explore the earth again is to understand how it is terraforming. You notice that play on walls the shift in meaning that we make to the term terraforming. Terraforming is generally conceived as ultra-technical, so it's a hypothetical terraforming of Mars, which is supposed to transform its atmosphere and climate to make it habitable for humans. On the contrary, here we define terraforming as an exclusively terrestrial practice shared with other living beings. Let's dive into this material shaping the Earth. What do we see? Ghost territory may due to the ignorance for the soil and its death. We don't know it because we don't see what is underneath, whether it, if, uh, it be those who inhabit the death or the object that we have deliberately buried in the earth strata, sometimes so that we can no longer see them. For us, the ground is a surface on which we walk or a surface what we share with the land registry. We buy a house, a plot of land, but this is a fictional boundary, a line on a piece of paper that assigns or denies the power to live in. But now we know that the effect of our actions, especially our wastes, is not limited to the surface, but flows into the ground, accumulates underneath, changes the chemistry of things and organisms sometimes even leading to their destruction. Thus, we suggest directing our gaze, our attention towards the soil, but also towards the sky, at least as far as the canopy, the limit where life can develop, the boundary of the critical zone. Let's now explore a speculative ground by following the various strata of this map of the soil. In the first meter, the circle closest to our epicenter shows matter that is forming with movement and composed of a variety of organic particles. Turning over this one meter of surface soil, we find that it's suffused with microfissures and weights a few thousand tons. In some places, however, there is nothing. The ground is dead, not empty, but nothing moves. Instead, pieces of rubble sink deeper. Continuing downward three meters, we follow the tunnels of badgers and the burrows of small mammals that guide us to the surface. These passageways are here and there, interrupted by concrete sarcophagi. Tanks, it seems, connected by a network of pipelines. Between the tanks, water infiltrates and drains their contents to greater depth. At 10 meters deep, 
we discover the remains of old buildings, white and rectangular, by compressed the soil and mixed with rocks. In the other hemisphere, the roots have already rejected them, pushing them to the surface, as if they were no longer welcome in the underground world. However, most of the time, the inhabitant organisms and the hosted objects coexist in the first levels. At 50 meters deep, we can no longer distinguish the origins of either because chemistry transforms organisms and materials alike. Finally, at one meter deep, the rocks testify to the latter state of the material transformations of the soil. The extent of human influence can be seen not only horizontally, but also vertically by the accumulation of anthropic objects and actions that have penetrated the soil to its deepest level. The model visualizes continuous flows between different ground levels a fluidity that is rarely associated with the Earth. Here, a landslide caused the merging of two strata, therefore of two periods of time that would otherwise never have met. Elsewhere, toxic substances have infiltrated through water, contaminating deep groundwater. The map allows these layers to be visualized by removing the scales and scanning the strata horizontally then concentrically replacing them around a void, the central circle, our atmosphere. The effects at the surface of various phenomena have become equally important. A fossil is as visible as a mine, a volcano as a tank, a network of pipelines as the water flowing between rocks. The soil, like a reversed skin, reveals what happens directly under its surface. Depending on its composition, it allows life or death. The soil that we discover is thick, granular, reactive, mixed, filled with scoria inherited from the movements and activities of the living beings who cross it literally in all directions. It is worn out in some places, even sometimes with holes in it. The model tries to make the boomerang effect tangible. By putting the atmosphere at the center in a vacuum, it shows that everything scattered in the atmosphere comes back to us as we lived in a closed system. It's as if there were no outside world, and even the supposedly airy atmosphere is full. Nanoparticles, clouds, planes, birds, spores, pollution smoke. Each, each object expelled into the sky, sky inevitably falls to the ground, and sometimes it bounces and ricochets. In the depth of the Earth, space is not endlessly available either because the subsoil is already saturated. Now uh, I will try to come back to my screen. Uh, can I share my screen? Oh, okay, thank you. So can everyone uh, come back uh, to my screen, please? So if uh, everyone is ready, I will continue with the next chapter uh, with, where we will decompose uh, the model of this map that we're just going to see and we're just going to hear as a narrative. And so uh, with this uh, kind of model, we suggest uh, exploring the earth as uh, really earth, as soil or humus and not as a globe. Uh, the soil model uh, try to make visible this critical zone, the earth pellicle that distributes and supports life forms from the rocks to the tree canopy. And so it aims to understand also the thickness of the earth, the strata and the earth layers. Uh, it's a visualization of the subsurface of the Earth rather than its surface only. And so through a thought uh, experiment, the model visualizes a reversed globe and what was external before the atmosphere is now uh, at the center and it's suddenly confined uh, in a closed, reduced and narrow space. 
And what was uh, the deepest uh, layers is now arranged in concentric circles uh, that move outwards toward the edges of the map. And so in this way, the entire model focuses uh, on the critical zone, uh, this uh, thin layer uh, around the earth where the soil, the water and the living world uh, interact. And where also uh, it's critical because human and non-human life and the resources uh, that sustain it are concentrated. This is not in the space uh, out, outer, uh, out of the, the earth, nor in the globe, but really in this critical zone. But that's why it's important also to visualize it and to understand what is uh, inside. But to acknowledge uh, the circulation of the element uh, that the scientists uh, are tracing in the layers of the critical zone, uh, including the atmosphere, we may have to devise uh, another tool, uh, another visual model, an instrument, to understand, for example, the carbon cycle, which is a huge uh, climate change variable. And to do so, uh, we continue to work with the scientists of the critical zone and with one of them, a geochemist, uh, we started to devise a tool that will trace the cycle of the carbon that we see uh, here in this short animation. And it uses a particular code, a graphic grammar, and uh, uses spirals uh, to visualize the speed at which the element is passing through the different earth layers. And each bifurcation of the spiral means that the carbon has been transformed. Uh, it represents a process. Uh, and then the sum of the process constitutes a cycle. So the cycle has are looping, except for one. Uh, if you look at the seven line, uh, it's almost vertical, uh, contrary to the others. And this shows the activity of human industries that brings back the carbon very quickly from the depth uh, to the atmosphere in such quantity that the recycling is not possible. And so the aim of this visualization is really to catch uh, in a glimpse, maybe I will, uh, the impact of uh, human activity on the biogeochemical cycles that the critical zone scientists uh, are analyzing in their observatories. And so with the carbon cycle, we see that uh, human is a strong perturbator and in other cases, uh, it creates previously inexistent cycles, uh, such as with nitrates, and it disturbs much more the earth uh, cycling. And this is actually what I call uh, a geography uh, instead of a geography, because the focus uh, is put on cycle fluxes and not only spatial boundaries. And this focus on cycles allow to record the animation of landscapes how the earth is actually shaped by fluxes of elements. If we compare the earth to Venus or Mars, we would see that the composition of the atmosphere is completely different. This is what Lovelock and Margulis have shown with the Gaia hypothesis. Our atmosphere is chemically unstable and therefore viable for us. It's not in thermodynamic equilibrium like the other planets, because bacteria emit gas that maintain the air conditioning of this planet Earth. And so when we think we are inside in architectural spaces and we think we are outside, out of a building, we are in fact always inside. The Earth, the landscape, is an interior that is maintained, transformed by living organisms. We are inside enclosures created by life. The exoskeleton of a mountain, for example, is also made up of dead microorganisms. This has different scales, but what is common is the capacity of living beings, including humans, to build. The problem is that the engineer's capacity of humans and the other than humans are now in competition with each other. And so this is actually the topic of the thought experiment, uh, the thought exhibition, sorry, critical zones, uh, which invites us to deal with the critical situation of the Earth in various ways and to explore new modes of coexistence between all life forms. So because of coronavirus, we opened both a virtual and a physical exhibitions. And for the virtual, virtual exhibition, we draw the map of an observatory of the critical zone using the soil model with real data from the scientists. 
Uh, and uh, at this uh, Critics Calzon Observatory, uh, he, he, which uh, records the dynamic of the Vosges forest uh, for uh, 30 years, uh, we can have a lot of data with the instruments that are uh, in blue uh, on, the, on the map. And uh, this landscape has been impacted by acid rain uh, due to a lot of sulfur uh, in the atmosphere, as I, I told uh, earlier. And so we spent some time in the field with the scientists uh, in the landscape, but also in their labs. And we try to understand uh, each instrument and what insight they get on nature. And so we insert the instrument on the map. And on the website, you can click on the instrument and you can watch films uh, on the uh, of the fields uh, to understand better the practices of the scientists. And you can also hear a kind of a collaboration with the compositor, uh, which who make a musical composition with the data of a scientist. So the exhibition is now opened uh, at the ZKM in Karlsruhe, Germany. And in the physical space, uh, you will find some of these elements, but displayed in a quite different overall setting. Uh, we are here in the exhibition space. And uh, the main idea of this installation was to put the observatory, the watershed, uh, inside the space of the museum. So we recompose this observatory in the museum space. And you see, in fact, uh, the different uh, instruments used in the field, which are constructed here. We, and they uh, diffuse uh, the various phenomena uh, that it captures on the field. So we did not represent a landscape like a picture or a postcard, uh, but uh, really with the scientists, we decided to simply show the instruments because they are the mediators, the sensors of the landscape. And the particularity is that they are played in the same place as they are on the site. So we kept the height and uh, the different, let's say, uh, to, uh, yeah, the relationship with all the instruments. So for example, the ones that are placed downstream, downstream are placed downstream in the museum and the one at the top are placed in the top. And you see the kind of skeleton, uh, the, uh, the structure um, through uh, the museum. It's actually uh, the topography which is reconstructed using geophones. Uh, which are represented with the tubular section that you see in the axonometric view. And on the field, the geophones uh, is an instrument that sounds the ground at depth by sending, sending vibrations into it. And it records the sensitivity of the soil to these vibrations in order to reconstruct rock's porosity. That is where, where rocks are uh, more uh, solid or where water is uh, more going to go through. And uh, so when you are uh, in, on the fr museum floor, you actually below ground inside this watershed. And so the visitor has to explore this landscape, so as we did in the field. And um, she has a field work to orient herself. And the instruments make you see or make you listen also invisible elements. And the landscape is thus, we hope, not seen uh, as a block from an external point of view but rather from and through uh, these entities, these parts, and this variation of the critical zone. And you, you yourself are inside, and you are part in some way uh, of the critical zone. The exhibition is much uh, larger than the installation. Uh, other artists contribute uh, to multiply the tools uh, for observation. And uh, this is rapidly the catalog with a lot of uh, different um, interesting articles. And now maybe uh, to end uh, the talk, I will uh, just introduce uh, the exercise. Uh, actually, actually, we can, uh, perhaps we can uh, right now have a small uh, discussion before, uh, 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 okay. before we move to the exercise, because this was, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, such a wonderful uh, talk. So perhaps if you, if you would like to stop sharing the screen mm -hmm. and we can discuss maybe for uh, maybe I would say 10, even 15 minutes, and then we can introduce the exercise. Yeah. Great. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Uh, I uh, invite uh, uh, everybody to to come back with with their videos and uh, perhaps uh, a virtual applause <laughs> for Alexandra. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, so uh, uh, I uh, I enjoyed uh, uh, really tremendously this uh, uh, this uh, talk uh, for a kind of a co for the, the, the sensitivity on many levels and the, the beautiful use of uh, terms, but also the beautiful use of uh, instruments and uh, drawings. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, I can um, I can start with the with the with the with the question about the. Uh, I think that uh, that. Um, uh, the idea of a critical zone as opposed to a surface, right, is something that allows you to move from, uh, uh, let's say, geography uh, as, a, as a simple kind of a, a observation of the Earth's surface to geography, which, uh, which follows uh, uh, cycles, which, uh, which uh, basically obliges us to look at the kind of dynamics of the of the Earth systems, right, or or a life supporting systems and critical zone. I I appreciate the term. I I find it. Uh, uh, in fact, we are talking about the Gaia zone in a way, the, the zone which supports life of uh, or organic life, which is indeed uh, very thin. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you have described in, uh, in a beautiful case studies, um, let's say three um, uh, ghosts, right? So these are in fact your instruments. So there are, we, we talk about the soil and water and in a way air or the kind of a complex sort of chemistry of, of air, right? And um, so I, uh, I, uh, I find it, uh, I find it uh, very fascinating how, how this, uh, uh, let's say, as a kind of uh, instrumentarium, as an intellectual instrumentarium, right? And so I, I would like to ask you, so from this observation where you're saying we have to work with scientists, no, we have to, we have to, we cannot uh, trust only our senses. We have to work with actually sensors. We, we, we have to work with the information uh, of, uh, uh, that reveals the invisible to us, right? The intangible, right? So we, we need to trust another kind of, uh, uh, let's say uh, inputs into our uh, to to complete our perception in order to be able to design right. So this has many implications. This means we have to be educated differently. We have to completely retune our to say so design sensibilities. Uh, uh, you know are around to say so different priorities and so on. So I would I would like to ask you. As a, as a landscape architect, right? Um, um, how how do you see these kinds of methods and insights and techniques unlocking the potentials to design also differently, right? Because as you describe, we are looking at a number of urgencies obviously that <laughs> where we should <laughs> should be able to act and i think uh, you know all all the all the all the students who are today with us in this auditorium you know should be able to to go out there and and you know make their uh, be part of all that right or to sort of uh, Re, re rewiring or 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 you know re, redesigning those systems in a different way. So, so I would like to ask you, where do you think we are, right? Or where 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 are you, right? So so let's say, do we have the right kind of tools, conceptual, scientific, to 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 go into the field and start designing, you know, in uh, uh, in a manner that uh, let's say supports. Uh, Gaia to say so, or that that uh, 
um, that acts uh, in, a, in a sensitive and a kind of a life affirming manner in the critical zone. Mm. Yes, um, right. Well, thank you for this um, well done <laughs> summarize. I think it's very <laughs> exhaustive and uh, complete. Um, to rephrase just the story why I started to uh, approach uh, the critical the, this network. Uh, so this is a network which is um, spread from US uh, to Europe. So there is also observatory in Germany and also now in Asia. And uh, at first uh, I felt uh, disoriented because of the Anthropocene and uh, because um, I felt that we didn't have the right tools to tackle this uh, this issue, which is bigger than uh, sometimes also our design projects. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, when I started to, uh, don't, thanks to uh, Bruno Latour, uh, who is uh, working on this uh, topic since many years, uh, so I uh, I uh, and I uh, was introduced uh, to uh, the network. And uh, they have also a problem, an issue uh, of representation, this critical zone. And that's uh, where uh, the architect or landscape architect can also uh, make uh, a contribution uh, because they have the tools to draw and to conceptualize and also to uh, work in a collaborative way with many uh, different disciplines, uh, which is not the case for all uh, the uh, the discipline of the practice and so it's really uh, we started to collaborate uh, i bring the tools of uh, design practice and the scientists bring uh, their knowledge and we start to think about how to visualize this critical zone so it's not too much so much about uh, having the same knowledge than uh, they have because it's like a different uh, topic and it's a uh, huge uh, it's chemistry it's geo uh, bio, bio, biochemistry or geophysics but it's really to collaborate and start to um, yeah maybe to um, to design uh, observat um, maybe urban observatories because because mm -hmm. the ones they have are more uh, natural ones even if uh, the anthropos is everywhere everywhere we, we can't uh, no more use nature at the same way but maybe yeah for for design projects um, design a kind of observatory in urban context mm -hmm. and try to gather a team around uh, around a space a ground a land uh, an observatory uh, where we can work uh, together i don't know if it's answer <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, exciting uh, idea to start an urban observatory, maybe in Zurich. <laughs> it's something <laughs> that we could uh, do at, uh, at the ETH. So uh, I invite, uh, would, uh, do we have uh, uh, questions this morning? Uh, maybe in a, in a chat or, or raise your hand somehow, we will see you. Perhaps I can continue with the second question and then certainly the third one uh, goes into the audience. So, uh, so I, uh, I find it uh, fascinating that uh, the work um, really promotes uh, a kind of a, a new coalition with, with scientists. No, that this is, this is really necessary and uh, I think uh, certainly if we want to talk about the soil or hydrology or, or uh, you know, the, 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 the movement of air and so on, this is, this is certainly uh, um, <clears throat> essential. Now, the, the question is that we, we don't uh, educate uh, architects or landscape architects in this manner, right? And and you are you are now a PhD student, and you have to say so crafted your your way through the uh, uh, scientific realm, <laughs> let's say, and and placed yourself in a in a certain position, which is not, I think, a position of a classical landscape architect, right? And perhaps you can talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, a kind of a essential 
coalition no in the in the field of uh, in the realm of scientific knowledge so where where is the landscape architect or a, or a geographer <laughs> or a, <laughs> we could say perhaps gaia architect uh, where, where is that architect placed among uh, other uh, fields of uh, let's say knowledge mm. um, who are your closest collaborators let's say uh, well, maybe I would talk about uh, this ZKM exhibition. Um, huh? So we uh, saw it because uh, I'm uh, on the other part of my life, um, member of uh, SOC, uh, Society for Object Cartographic, where we try to uh, think at alternative maps, but we also um, make this uh, installation. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we work a lot with the uh, philosopher, uh, with uh, historians, um, and with the scientists. So there is uh, geochemists, biochemists, geophysician, pedologists, hydrologists, and uh, maybe what the experience of this exhibition make us realize that we. As architect, we are like a mediator also of all these uh, disciplines, and uh, we can also make fin, render uh, concrete some ideas. Uh, so maybe this is, uh, um, yeah, what uh, what our major contribution to this uh, exhibition is: how to render concrete. Uh, sometimes ideas and also how to uh, finally uh, scale down uh, the watershed inside the museum. So you, we use actually the tools of an architect, uh, the model, but in a just a slightly different uh, way. Uh, and yeah, the installation is like a scale model. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I don't know if it's answer to your question. It's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a perfect answer. It's a perfect answer. Yeah. Thank you. It's a, it's a, a wonderful answer. How about uh, our... Uh, about questions. <laughs> uh, more questions, yes. Okay, we have a question. I think it's uh, Charlene, right? Oh, Charlene? No? Okay, sorry. No, that was not a question, sorry. <laughs> oh, that is okay, no problem. I would, like, I would like to ask actually a question to Alexandra regarding, you know, the, the mapping of this uh, um, critical zone you are making, like what is the interest actually of the scientists in having this kind of maps and how does it contribute to their field? Like, yeah. what about, yeah, that do, do you know, like in your conversations, did it come up and how did you come up with this, uh, uh, let's say, collaboration and what is their interest in this? Mm. So, yeah, uh, they, they have uh, uh, an issue regarding the representation of the critical zone. They only use this uh, kind of, uh, either the globe, uh, but uh, if you use a globe, you can't see uh, the critical zone or uh, a block diagram with um, arrows and uh, to show the fluxes. And uh, so that's um, uh, how we come to uh, work together, uh, because as an architect, we also have tools and we can think about uh, alternative uh, visualizations. So we we start to work uh, on this topic. And uh, the other uh, thing is that uh, these scientists are also interested in social studies and to be linked more with humanities and politics because they are uh, working on issues, uh, territorial issues. And so sometimes they, uh, they have difficulties to speak to politicians or uh, or make policies on territories. And so this also interests them to, uh, to work with, um, with uh, people who are background in humanities or architecture, because yeah, architecture manage also <laughs> uh, policies in, on a territory. So that's the, the two 
uh, maybe to, to um, uh, we are contribution or how we can also help uh, them in their research or great i see two two questions actually in the chat now also three four wow that's great so we have a, so i i will invite first leonie wagner would you like to 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 tell us your question it's funner when you do it yourself here is Leonie. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I wonder why you place the atmosphere in the middle um, of the section in your map. We didn't quite understand that. Okay. So um, first, uh, um, the first issue was to uh, make see, make visible uh, the thin layer of the critical zone because at the scale of the Earth we can't see anything. Uh, so first it was to uh, make more place for the soil and then it comes naturally to put the atmosphere in the middle because of the interrelation between the soil and the atmosphere and so when uh, the atmosphere is, or is at the center it also uh, means that all uh, the pollutants for, that we emit from one place, place is uh, coming back in our head and so uh, when you put the atmosphere in the play in, in, at the center, uh, bounded by the soil and by the rocks, uh, you, you can't imagine that the atmosphere, uh, there is um, uh, no limit, but we have bounded actually, there is limit uh, even in the sky. Uh, and that's why we have CO2 concentrating in the atmosphere, that's why we have too much uh, uh, nitrate. Uh, that's, um, that, that's why uh, I think this, this view of the globe is really mistaken because we, we are the impression that we can, uh, we can have no planetary boundaries, but I also uh, I show in the uh, lecture uh, with this uh, diagram made by the Earth Ion system. Uh, we uh, actually have boundaries and we overcross them. Uh, so how not to, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, maybe it's, it's answer your question now. And the, yeah, okay. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very clear question. So the atmosphere is, is finite and it's captured inside exactly. the earth like in a room, right? And there is a finite amount of air in this room. Exactly. That, that's very clear. That's great. So uh, wonderful. So uh, very, very fantastic idea how representation can really expand uh, our uh, ways of seeing actually and in a in a very uh, in a very urgent ways so we have a, a second question from lino good morning lino where are you hi i don't know if you can see hi. me or hear me uh, i had a question actually because i was quite fascinated by all the um, new ways of representation that you use and that somehow expresses or represents some kind of reality that we don't see anymore, we, don't, we cannot immediately see. And I was wondering, as a landscape architect, if you use them also to design or how, I mean, you are kind of exploding this traditional way of plan and section. And so wondering if you also use them to design or to project somehow, or is there a way to? Okay. Um, the first step uh, that I'm going to do now is uh, describe uh, the different layers uh, of this critical zone. So we, we, don't, uh, we didn't uh, use it um, for now for project design, but we hope maybe later. Uh, but there is um, first a, a very important step to uh, describe what, in which uh, soil we are, because uh, it's, maybe it's not uh, usual also for design practitioners to spend a lot of uh, time describing uh, really what is the territory. We, we have also to slow down maybe, um, even if we, we are huge 
also to to design and to propose things. Uh, but I think this uh, this slowing down is also important to be able to uh, yeah to describe more precisely and uh, and to propose something that is uh, relevant also for territories. Um, but after it's kind of the it's kind of the same. It's a visual that you can use also to uh, uh, for. I don't know to bring your project, mm -hmm. but I yeah I I can't tell because uh, I didn't uh, experience it, and mm -hmm. as I am a pragmatist, I don't want to yeah. go further. <laughs> <laughs> Great, I mean that's uh, I think it's very clear, and I think uh, I agree that that we we need time in order to. Um, understand, I mean, to readjust somehow our, our paradigms, right? And I think paradigms that drive design, right? So like what, what are our, our, our standpoints, our goals? And so this involves a kind of a paradigmatic shift. So I think on many levels, I mean, as, as, uh, and I think that these are, we are in the process of, of doing that. So Indeed, but these, these, uh, I think these uh, uh, very interesting uh, observatories, I mean, they could also be used to evaluate the kind of possible scenarios, isn't it? So let's say mm -hmm. if, if yeah. one was to, to somehow intervene in your watershed, right? There are different ways of doing that and one could evaluate the kind of possible uh, futures using using that uh, observatory as a, as a kind of way to to simulate or suggest what might happen and so on mm -hmm. and i think this would this would give us a much uh, much better ways to to uh, negotiate between the different proposals so shall we do you know carbon capture and storage or shall we do you know planting trees or or shall we you know how shall we uh, uh, i don't know rebuild soil etc cetera, etc cetera. so so many different uh, uh, options are on the table you know or shall we just build new infrastructure and a hydro dam and i don't know what so so i think uh, these uh, um, also negotiating between these different scenarios is very complex so we need the different kind of tools to to actually be able to 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 negotiate uh, such complexity that arrives with design intervention no yeah i think exactly. that's and and uh i just add that uh it's actually the the, the critical zone scientists also have to build model to predict things exactly and i think which uh, predictions can also be used uh, in our landscape design project in a way so right yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, so we have uh, two more questions, and then we move to the exercise. So this morning we have also Louis. Hello, Louis. Yeah, for your presentation, I was wondering if the universe plays a role in your model, as the universe has an impact on the soil, on the atmosphere. So, does it have a role in your model as well? Um. Not really, but I would say that the universe play a role in the for the gravimeter, for example, uh, that uh, uh, that records the, var uh, the gravity of the mass of the Earth. But for the critical zone, is um, is very far from where we live, and in the universe there is no life, uh, so it's very centered. Uh, to the earth, I would say, to the earth, but as uh, as uh, not far from few uh, few meters down and few meters up, uh, which is a kind of boundaries of the critical zone, which is really uh, plastic, but still, uh, it's not the entire universe. I would say, <laughs> it's not a universe. Great, thank you. I think this is this is really a, a philosophical uh, question. Where where is life? 
<laughs> how wide is the critical zone? Is there life in the in the universe, or uh, and so on? And what what is so in a way the critical zone really is a kind of a philosophical, to say so, perimeter of our understanding of of life. Let's say on Earth and around Earth and so on. Wonderful. So uh, we have our last question from Alex. Alex Farina, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I had a question about how and how much the economic and the political world, we can say, are involved in these studies, but also in a more concrete way in, I don't know, trying to find regulations or large scale plans and agreements about this topic. Okay, and in your question, is there uh, already an economic and political concrete involvement universally? Okay, uh, how can I say? Uh, economic, I don't know what it means, um, but in a political way, uh, I think when uh, doing arts also and exhibitions, uh, it, it's, it's like doing a political reenactment of what can be done in the real world. And that's why also we are doing uh, exhibition. And I think arts can be really politics uh, because it's, it's, it's not a top down, um, let's say uh, top, it's not top down, but it really brings uh, something down uh, to the people and then for the people to uh, maybe after uh, bring these actions uh, in the in their world i don't know if i if i uh, yeah answer to your question but uh, i just say that um, with the arts with for promoting also on every uh, every manners uh, this uh, this knowledge is uh, political actions mm -hmm. okay See, yeah, yeah, you answered. Thank you. Great. So we we will make an exception for Nasli. Uh, she 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 can uh, she she de, she gets an exception. Yeah. So Nasli, please uh, give, uh, tell us your your question. Thanks a lot for the exception. I mean, I kind of find really interesting this differentiation between the world we live in and the world we live from. And I think it's quite also uh, refreshing to see the whole, uh, let's say, this Gaia as uh, a terra incognita, something that we need to discover, and uh, this uh, simultaneity of these two worlds. And uh, it's almost like the world we live from, which is also something that we are all interested in, in uh, terms of hinterlands and this more than human territories, etc., uh, these invisibilized geographies, let's say, that mm -hmm. they are kind of uh, haunting the world we live in. So it's like almost overflowing. We are living in kind of like a stranger things world or something. So I was wondering within these critical zone observatories, I guess one of the aims is to invisibilize this uh, world that we live from. And uh, I was wondering what happens when these both worlds are superimposed or uh, somehow come together and how does this also help us in our disciplines of uh, design and planning? Uh, I'm not sure I, I understand the end of your question. I, think I mean, these uh, ways of representation, I guess it's one of the aims is to also visibilize this world that we live from, uh, like these hinterlands and resources, etc., and what we have been maybe ignoring uh, for a while now. And how do you think this helps us in, uh, let's say, uh, for the future? Mm. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's totally that uh, how uh, this invisible geography haunted us. I think it's really. Uh, but I'd, I think maybe uh, in our design project, we should acknowledge uh, the materials and also uh, the, the land that we use uh, for doing projects. I don't know uh, in which way, uh, but we are, um, 
we are actually thinking about that uh, in our atelier workshop. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 also a difficult uh, uh, yeah difficult approach because it's difficult to trace. Uh, all the elements or all the materials. Mm -hmm. So how do you account for this? And this is where comes again the description and how to slow down because uh, mm -hmm. we don't really know how to trace it. And uh, that's why yeah, the work with the scientists could be interesting because they are able to trace erosion, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or where the different elements come from, uh, what is in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thank you. This is uh, this is wonderful. So uh, I think it's a, it's a great message in a way that there is a, a kind of a phenomenally urgent task for architects and landscape architects out there for this generation. As soon as you graduate, please engage. Uh, uh your your energy to to help uh, uh, move forward this uh, a tremendously important project and uh, uh, now uh, to to get you started alexandra will present her exercise <laughs> he was so asking is, if there could be another exception for him but uh... Maybe afterwards, let's yeah. now move to, to the exercise, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I get to my screen again. Okay, so the exercise we prepare is uh, actually extract for, from uh, the book uh, Terraforma and also the map that I present, uh, the soil, uh, the river soil is the first model of uh, the so seven chapters, and in this book, yeah, each uh, chap each model uh, leads to uh, a map, and I present uh, the one in the right uh, top uh, right, uh, and uh, what the exercise is about uh, is to actually uh, make uh, this soil model with a place that you choose. Uh, it could be uh, a place uh, where you live in, but so you will have to acknowledge uh, the places you live from, as we are discussed. It could be also a place uh, of your project design. And so um, the idea is to reconstruct uh, this uh, soil model using the three steps that I will develop. Uh, and uh, to um, yeah to map uh, a place, uh, a ground, uh, using this tool, and maybe we will say uh, uh, we will see if it's uh, uh, allowed to to have more variety of heterogene or heterogeneity. So in the first steps, uh, the idea is to map the atmosphere. What is above you? And uh, uh, we also write uh, some questions to help you to map it and to uh, maybe you can answer first to this question and then uh, try to draw uh, it uh, in the first circle uh, of the atmosphere. So how do you describe the chemical and physical matters of the earth that surrounds you and that you breathe? What are the beings and processes that contribute to making your atmosphere what it is? And so you see, you, you know that air is invisible and yet there is uh, particles everywhere. So you can also research the composition of your atmosphere uh, with, for example, climate monitoring websites. The second steps would be to, uh, under the, uh, to understand what is under the surface, so to map the soil. So this is the second uh, circle which uh, is about um, zero to uh, two meters below ground. 
Uh, and to, answer, to, to help you draw, the question is what makes uh, up the soil, which is certainly the most important layer uh, to you. Uh, what is composed on which you live and uh, in which you live. So um, there is also um, a difference between the on and the in. And uh, you can also uh, ask where do they come from, all these materials, how old they are, uh, where does the water you use come from, how old is it, and also where does the food you eat come from, and how, how old is it, and maybe it could help you. I don't know, we will see. And uh, try to be also as exhaustive as possible. Uh, what are the anthropogenic objects? Uh, is there tunnels, pipelines, etc. if you are in a urban context? Uh, are there organisms? Uh, are there roots? Uh, what are the other uh, tiny elements that uh, you can't see with the map, but maybe if you uh, try to see uh, down there, uh, you, can, uh, you can see, uh, you can imagine uh, what is in, inside uh, and what is under our feet. And uh, the last step steps uh, would be to uh, map the deep rocks. So what is below ground? And so uh, ge ge geologically speaking, what are the beings and processes that enable to you to keep your house? And uh, most importantly, which ones can destabilize it? So maybe here you can search for geological data. Uh, in books uh, or in the internet, or if you have the chance to interview some geologists. Uh, you can also uh, look for holes in the ground. Uh, maybe um, there are next to you uh, a mine or a carrier. Um, and uh, yes, that's it. And maybe you can go until yeah, 100 meter. It's deep, but with geological map, you can find uh, some interesting um, things to map. And so, yeah, the, yeah, the exercise may be uh, if you share with uh, it uh, with uh, your, uh, your fellow students, you, can, you would see different understanding of the same soil. And that's uh, what uh, we can call also Gaia, which is very heterogeneous uh, as a surface of as the earth. So yeah, maybe I will just come back to um, the A3, the, the sheet that you will have, or maybe you already have it. And yeah, how do you describe each layers of the critical zone from the atmosphere to the deep rocks? And don't forget, I will I just say, don't forget the captions. Uh, it's very important, don't forget to name every element on the map. And then maybe also imagine a story. Uh, imagine that you have to uh, um, explain this map, uh, which kind of exploration narrative uh, could you, you uh, use? If you are, we have questions also maybe. Fantastic, very clear and uh, very, um, very to the point. So basically, let's uh, let's uh, uh, look beyond the the surface. As an architect, site is not just uh, let's say a plot, but it's a kind of a three dimensional, uh, uh, basically part you are in a certain place in the critical zone and can you describe that that part of the critical zone that you occupy either where you live or where your project is maybe it's uh, it's something that would tie in very well to your current design studios <laughs> that you're doing so so that's uh, that would be that would be very interesting so let's uh, let's have a few questions uh, on the exercise And maybe it, after this, I could take over, present some parameters that we have. So if there are no questions. Yeah. We have a couple of more questions in the chat. If, uh, um, if there are no questions on the exercise, uh, 
Metaxia will tell you about uh, about the deadline and so on. Um, I actually have a question. Anna Maria. Okay, great. Yeah. So I don't really understand in this map if we have to focus only on the soil or like in the atmosphere. As a person, I see an airplane and this is not related to the soil. Can I draw on top of the map the airplane? Or it is it has nothing to do like I I just want some more explanation which kind of element mm -hmm. you want us to map. Uh, if it's in your um, uh, view situation, uh, you can, and if it has a real impact on you, you have to, uh, yeah, to draw the plane because may maybe the, the plane. Huh? That's yeah, yeah, the plane, yeah. Or a bird, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, because you talk yeah. about particles, but for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, no, it can, okay. if it has a real impact on your territory. For example, you are under, um, how do you say, corridor, aerial corridors, and it makes a lot of noise uh, or a lot of, yeah, particles. Uh, or if uh, the birds are really important for this territory and, that's, um, and that you, you know how also to map it, or maybe you can find some uh, information uh, with a bird specialist uh, to try to understand how their territories are working to. Uh, so if uh, this element is really important in the territory that you are mapping, you have to, yeah, you have to, to map it. Even if it's like an object or uh, an organism or living beings, it's, uh, it matters, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the interesting part is, of course, this change of projection, right? So you are, you are taking something which is organized in a kind of a radial centric principle, no? So it's not a kind of a planimetric grid anymore, but it's basically you're drawing nested spheres, right? Atmosphere, soil, deep rock, right? So this yeah. is a different way of looking. Yeah, and just um, you you don't have too much to focus on the scales. Uh, you can draw uh, tiny elements, uh, like for example fossils, which are very tiny, uh, but also like big movements. But um, you can you can try to make them bigger than they they are. So there is no really scales, uh, but it's more of uh, depending on the importance of the element. Uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> I see a couple of questions coming up in the chat. So for instance, one is, can, can we have the slides? Sure, you will, you will get the slides as soon as the lecture finishes. As I responded to some of them already. Right, and then we, we have a question from Maximilian who says, should the exercise be understood as scientific or can it be conceptual? So that's an interesting question. Is there ever a difference, I wonder? What do you think, Alexandra? Uh, if it has to be scientific, it's the question. Uh, can the exercise be understood as scientific or can it be conceptual? Ah, okay. Um, it adds to be the more precise because uh, the aim is really to um, to describe the critical zone that you are in. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you can extrapolate, you can imagine some things, uh, but uh, you yeah you have to to be precise in the elements. So maybe not too much conceptual, mm -hmm. but really stick to the. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, uh, I would say to to the extent that you have the the data, try to be precise. And sometimes you simply won't have the information, but you will have a, a rather a, a, you you will be able to to suggest the existence of a certain, uh, let's say, cycle or a ghost or a, or a, you know, based on based on uh, information that is perhaps not. Uh, uh, you know, quantifiable or, or you know, quantified or, or so basically I think in that case you can be to say some more sketchy, right? Yeah. And uh, 
So let's say try to, to link the, the kind of representation with the kind of information that you have, yeah. And I think uh, what you showed, Alexandra, is also that uh, scale is not crucial in the sense that if some elements are, let's say, microscopic, but they are hugely important, right? So you, you will rather to say, so exaggerate the scale in order to, 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 to say, so to link um, everything in a, in a, uh, according to the kind of hierarchy of things that you see, right? So you, you are, you are, re-establishing the, the kind of perceptions of, of hierarchies and importance of elements by, by exaggerating scale, essentially. Exactly. Great. And, uh, um, okay, there are, there are uh, various other uh, uh, questions. We will answer them. One, one interesting one, uh, do we have to read design with nature for next <laughs> session? I uh, have to comment on that. It's a very thin book and make sure that you read it as soon as possible, maybe not for the next session, but really as soon as possible because it's very useful for, for your life in the future as an architect. Okay, so... Uh, for the next session, I think it's if you don't have the time, at least try to have a, uh, an overview because this book is it's a little bit. Um, I mean, you need to have the overview to understand what's happening. Otherwise, it's it's not complete. Great. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, I uh, I think uh, uh, to. May I ask you, Metaxia, would you, would you like to, to just give us a couple of parameters and then we might have in the end one, one more question for Alexandra? Yes, just first, I want to thank Alexandra. I think the lecture was really nice and somehow touching in a way. So thanks, thanks so much for this. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Wait, I hope you see my keynote. So actually, uh, just to remind you that this is one of the three graded exercises that we will have this semester. So the, the sketches you're doing you're not, um, in the beginning of its course, course are not graded, but this one will be. So we ask you to, to use an A3 paper in a horizontal format. You can be free to respond either with a hand drawing, a digital drawing, or a mix of both. Uh, you would need to, to upload at the server the exercise by the 15th of October. And we would like to ask you also to send a hard copy to the chair at the end of the semester together with the other exercises. Um, here reminding you that at the end of the semester, we're actually making a, an archive of your exercises. This is from previous semesters where the concept was, um, uh, or the theme was my, my Zurich. Um, so we actually try to collect all your hand sketches and this remains as a kind of archive of these discussions and also of the, um, the topics we, we tackle. Uh, so try to really take care in the way you do these exercises because they will remain in the future. Um, as Milica mentioned, um, we will send you an email with um, the slides that Alexandra prepared for you, um, also with the parameters. Uh, and I think this is all for the exercise. Um, Maybe if we can take one minute um, to say that we are receiving really a lot of questions from all of you. And as you are quite many and you, most of you reply to the email, it's a little bit difficult to keep track of all the questions. So it would be nice if you could address the questions at the end of the lecture so that we can reply in a way that everybody follows the answers. Um, I think this is all from my side. I hope you were able to connect now to the course server. Make sure you're inscribed at my studies because this is how we send the weekly mail. We use the mails that you have there. So that's it from my side. And thanks again, Alexandra, for this beautiful lecture. Yeah, it, uh, it, uh, I, uh, I'm wondering uh, um, uh, whether to to continue the discussion, but we, I think we are at uh, at uh, already close to uh, close to the the expiry of our time. So I would I would rather rather suggest that we that we stop here. And uh, actually, Alexandra, if you agree, we would uh, we would send you the exercises to have a look at them. 
and uh, perhaps yeah, I will. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. So perhaps you will you will share with us a, a, a small comment that we will we will uh, bring back to the students. No? Yeah, sure. And if that you are great. So uh, so in a way, the the we, we we don't ask Alexander to actually grade because it's it's a lot of work. So let's say we will we will grade, but we will certainly take Alexandra's criteria on board and and uh, grade uh, accordingly. And uh, I see uh, uh, one more question was uh, also partly regarding the scale. What is the area of observation we are talking about? Are we focusing on the ground right below us or a quarter of a city? So so there is a you, you have to look at uh, at the template. So Alexandra made a sketch. So it really focuses on the scale of a human being. So it's it's really rather a, a kind of an area in the close proximity around you. No. So you can, uh, it is, uh, I would say there is not a kind of a macro effort here, but I think scale is actually, even, even with that, uh, 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 I think uh, scale is, is, is perhaps uh, uh, can, can vary from student to student. I mean, let's say the, the notion of the yeah. site or a place can, can one can, one can determine what is important, right? But I think it can be it can be rather 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 to say so uh, small in the end, right? Yeah, because uh, the most you enlarge your area, the most it will be difficult maybe to get the data. So, in order to not complex too much the exercise, uh, you can yeah either focus on your quarter or um, maybe a place that you, uh, uh, you, you travel very often, like maybe a park, or you can also choose a ruined uh, landscape. It can be also interesting. Mm -hmm. A place that you, you know, uh, which is not too much large, but uh, outside also. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you can do in the building, but it could be more difficult maybe. Uh, you can also experiment uh, with uh, what you think uh, it would be interesting to to map. It's very experimental, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, this is fantastic. We are doing an experiment in geography of uh, critical zones. Very necessary experiment. So it's uh, your your uh, let's say inspired contributions on this new uh, form of representation are most uh, welcome. So uh, uh, with this, I, I thank Alexandra very warmly for, for this uh, uh, wonderful lecture. I hope you, you had uh, all a very good morning and uh, uh, that you're all inspired uh, today. And uh, please, uh, let's, uh, let's do a very nice uh, <laughs> virtual applause for Alexandra right now. <laughs> thank you, Alexandra. <laughs> thank you all for listening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, for being with us. If you like, stay with us, Alexandra, for a minute uh, online and uh, uh, have a great week.